Yeah. So what is kind of the, can we jump back to kind of the, yeah, the history totally. development of, of LIDAR? Yeah, let's. So the most fun fact about LIDAR is that it was conceived of in 1930 and the laser was invented um, in 1960. So th- there was a, uh, an Irish savant uh, who was probably on the spectrum. He would probably have been diagnosed with Asperger's today. Uh, mm-hmm. named E.H. Singh, Edward Hutchinson Singh, S-Y-N-G-E. And he lived with his parents into his 30s. His, uh, he corresponded with Einstein on some of his ideas, and Einstein actually responded to him. In, in the early 1930s, when he, was, uh, when he was in his late 30s, he published three or four articles in something called Philosophical Magazine in, in London. And philosophical, philosophical magazine is something with philosophy. Natural philosophy was what they called physics back then, basically. So this guy, Hutchy, was his nickname. And mm-hmm. we op- the book opens with, with him. Um, imagined using World War I, zillions of World War I surplus searchlights, giant lights to illuminate the upper atmosphere. Because, again, balloons couldn't get up there. At the time, you know, in the 1930s, meteorology, they understood that most weather came from the, the lower atmosphere. But even that, even now, there are interactions between stratosphere and the troposphere, which is what the lower atmosphere that we're breathing is, that we don't quite get, right? So he mm-hmm. says, let's, let's use these surplus searchlights, b- blast the sky, and then we'll have elsewhere a photo detector, which basically takes light and turns it into electrons that can be can be uh, read by an oscilloscope or these days, all kinds of different ways, right? So essentially he used, and this is a thought experiment, didn't do it. Nobody, you know, 1930, nobody was going to go out and use hundreds of searchlights, whatever. Mm-hmm. But several years later, um, Carnegie Institution in Washington and Naval Research Lab scientists independently, um, although in sequence, so they used each other's, you know, learnings, proved that it would work, essentially. And so they had searchlights, and so they're using searchlights as their power source as their light source and right. blasting the upper atmosphere and then looking f- to see basically particles what's what are the aerosols we've heard about aerosols with covid right it's the stuff that you don't want to be breathing in mm-hmm. well, those are all over the place in the atmosphere so that's how it started and then um right before world war ii is when it was starting to get proven out people were like hey we could really use this to understand what's in the up- upper atmosphere and i mentioned the sodium thing right well, if you have certain wavelengths, if you know what your laser wavelength is and you tune it to an, a certain element, we can figure out what's actually up there. That's pretty cool. How much oxygen, how much nitrogen, say, based on the way the light bounces back. I mean, how they do this is nuts, but they do it. Yeah. World War II happens, right? So the guys that were working on this um, stopped working on it. And that sort of put it to, put it to bed for a little while mm-hmm. until the early 1960s when Ted Maiman at Hughes Lab uh, a huge, uh, huge aircraft at the time, sorry, in, I think it's Palo Alto is where they are, um, invents the laser. And suddenly it's like immediately everybody was like, because they knew from, from radar, right? They were, and they squeezed radar into microwaves and smaller and smaller and smaller wavelengths. Mm-hmm. And they knew that if we had a tighter wavelength, we could do A, B, C, and D, but they just didn't know how to make a laser. As soon as the laser got made, atmospheric scientists picked up where Hutchie left off um, and Hutchie had died in 1956 in an asylum, as it turned out. He never saw this come to fruition. Oh, man. Um, yeah. And started, you know, they, everybody that did laser science in the early days apparently wanted to use an anti-aircraft gun thing. So they, would, they, they painted the air, anti-aircraft gun thing white. And they would seriously they'd borrow a laser from somebody and, you know, photo detect. Everybody had photo detectors. At, and this is SRI, which is Stanford Research Institute. Mm-hmm. An institution, I think it is. SRI today. Um, and they started ha- hitting pollution plumes with and starting to, fig- to try to figure out what can this laser see? And they realized that, yeah, we can see pollution, ground level pollution, um, and we can see clouds. Where, what's the cloud ceiling? Well, we can measure that really exactly now, uh, stuff like that. And at the same time, they were using them at MIT. Um, there was a team that did a project called Luna C, L U N A space S E E. It sounds like lunacy. Their, their goal was to shoot the moon with a laser, which they did in 1962. Um, and that work led to further upper atmospheric research. One of the scientists that was involved in hitting the moon, which is really just a technology demonstration, was like, we're seeing reflections off of stuff 80 miles up, right? What is that stuff? Um, 
So yeah, that's how it kind of evolved in the atmospheric side. At the same time, Hughes, the military contractor, has this this laser that can measure things 100,000 times more accurately than radar. That might be useful because we do fire control systems for the M60 Cold War tank. So let's in- integrate that. So they did a couple of technology demonstrations with something they called the Colidar, C-O-L-I-D-A-R, which was a fact. They put, it, put the electronics in a Cub Scout, Cub Scout backpack and had this hokey look, and it looked like a, like a weird <laughs> double-barreled shotgun. But it was really accurate, and they modified that, and the Defense Department was like, yeah, that's pretty useful. And suddenly they have a pretty good business based on lasers. So you started with, with military, develop, military contractors developing it, um, atmospheric scientists getting into it, as soon as the atmospheric guys, both lower and upper atmospheric guys, got into it, um, they started recognizing the, the potential value in bathymetry, meaning measuring the um, the the underwater land, if you will, of the coastal mm-hmm. coastal mapping, um, and then it just went went on from there. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, and autonomy, vehicle autonomy, because we should definitely talk about that. Um, that got going really early too. It is of you know, they weren't using lasers at the time, but they were trying to do the perception systems for self-driving cars in the early 1960s also. Um, a lot of it was funded by NASA. Hey, thanks for watching this video. This is my dog, Murphy. And these are dog treats. Now I'll give Murphy one of these dog treats. And all you have to do is press the like button. Just press that little like button right down there at the bottom of this video. And this sweet, adorable, cute little puppy gets a treat. All thanks to you. All right, you did it? Okay. I believe you. You said you did it. There you go, Murph. She got that treat because of you. Now, I'll eat one of these treats, and all you have to do is click that subscribe button. Right there, pointing to it. Just click that subscribe button. Subscribe to curiosity with me, Travis DeRose. Get lots of good video, and I'll eat this treat. All right, you did that too? That's not very good. We're all not very good.